Hey everybody, welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here, very happy to welcome Matt Medney and Dave Irwin from Heavy Metal Magazine to talk about the past, present, and future of Heavy Metal. Now, the guys have taken over the magazine and uh, have an interesting direction coming up. Of course, Heavy Metal has an iconic history, as you can see from these covers. Uh, what a collection of amazing art uh, representing the world as far as science fiction and fantasy images. And it's really a pleasure to talk to them about the lineage of Heavy Metal and their plans for Heavy Metal's future as a publication. In two weeks, Heavy Metal will present its 299th issue, and then coming up in August, it's the iconic Heavy Metal 300. But that's not all that's going on with Heavy Metal Magazine. Heavy Metal Magazine has also created a new comics monthly imprint called Virus, featuring work from such creators as Dylan Sprouse and actor Dan Fogler. We talk about that in this conversation with David and Matt. The past, present, and future of Heavy Metal Magazine on today's Word Balloon. Very happy to welcome David Irwin and Matt Med Medney. Am I saying it right, Matt? Yes. All right, excellent. Uh, two men from Heavy Metal who are here to talk about uh, a lot of things going on. But as I'm learning prior to us uh, starting live uh, that uh, you guys uh, have interesting careers prior to Heavy Metal as well. But welcome to the show. Nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you too, yeah. John. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. My pleasure. Absolutely. So, um, should we do our your your origin stories, gentlemen? Um, you know, I'd love to. I'd love to hear them and stuff. And uh, yeah, you know. So yeah, Matt, uh, tell us tell us about how you. Uh, yeah, got, I, I, got I have to start because if David started, no one would care about mine. <laughs> I, uh, I I started in music as a uh, tour and production manager. So I've I've produced events. Uh, across uh, 45 countries um, for seven different bands, 350 shows. Um, and uh, then I moved from live events to the record biz, started a record label that um, paired music and comic books uh, for releases. And uh, it was called Hero Records. And we released uh, musicians that we would create original stories for and animate those as motion comic music videos. And uh, then about Seven and a half months ago, I met uh, the owner of Heavy Metal, and uh, he was looking for a new management team, and we had uh, come to a really cool uh, agreement, and now uh, I'm over here running Heavy Metal, and uh, the first person I knew I had to bring in was uh, Mr. Irwin, who uh, me and him have been friends for, for a little while now, and uh, it was just the, the perfect fit, but I'll let, I'll let the, uh, the, the Cape Crusader uh, give his origin story now. <laughs> David? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, I, yes, born on Krypton, no, the, uh, the real origin. Um, so, now the, uh, yeah, so years ago, I was the uh, executive creative director of DC Comics, and the, um, you have the publishing side, and you have everything else, and so as the executive creative director at DC, and I had been there for, uh, I was there for 16 and a half years. What and, period, David? Yeah, so at the time when I started at DC, uh, you know, a division of Warner Brothers, yeah. Warner Brothers really didn't care anything about uh, Batman or Superman or any of, you know, they, they were focused on Looney Tunes and Scooby and all these other- uh, What was it, like 94? Uh, yeah, 95, 95. Is that when you started or is that- Yeah, uh, 95, yeah. Okay, continue. And the, um, they, uh, and so I used to have to go out to LA all the time. And they used to always say that, you know, Looney Tunes are crown jewel. And I was like, no, where are your crown jewels? And the, um, so uh, the way it works, which a lot of people don't, didn't know or don't know, is that DC, even though they, re, they are a division of Warner Brothers, they are the owners of the properties. So if Warner Animation wants to do a Batman cartoon, it has to be licensed from DC. If you want to do direct to home video, then it has to be licensed. If you want to do, you know, uh, a movie, it has to be licensed. Once all of these things are, uh, so I was out in LA working with every division of Warner Brothers. And once the contracts are signed, then I would come in and uh, really be the, the final sign off on all the creative. 
So I was very involved and I would choose the, the projects I wanted to really, that I thought was important in order to build our properties into true global brands. And so I was very, very hands-on and so hands-on, you know, earlier before I came on and uh, we, we were talking about the dark night. And one of the things that I did because of my, uh, 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 I guess, I don't know, uh, uh, desire to make sure that we stayed on brand and kept the message the way that uh, I thought was important. Uh, I, uh, aside from Chris Nolan directing Heath Ledger as a Joker, I was the other person who directed Heath Ledger as a Joker. So all of the images that you've seen for the, like the theatrical posters, the, the campaign, global campaign, the merchandise, all the t-shirts, all that stuff that you've seen, the packaging, all of that came from me directing it as well as having my staff at DC that would provide all the materials. So I'd work with uh, Chris, uh, work with, you know, I would do, uh, worked with uh, Heath Ledger, I would direct him, and same with uh, Christian Bell, all those images that you see. So you see them online sometimes, you'll see these images that have not been doctored and, and you'll see it on a, like a, on a seamless. So those are all stuff that I, I was directing. Uh, That's amazing. You know, so were you on set while they were shooting? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the the when we did the photo shoot, the way it works on, on these movies, I could never get the actors um, at my disposal until the director had committed that costume onto film, because they're constantly tweaking it. Sure. Constantly. So once it's committed to film, then that's when I would come in, and then I would have my you know my shoots and and the um, uh, so in that particular case. It was the uh, the first scene that uh, Nolan was directing with Heath was the bank scene where the, the guy is on the you know hanging upside down in the video, and yep. so they had closed off half the bank building for me, and so I had the entire Nolan team reporting to me, and uh, and uh, so I was directing you know, his crew and uh, and then Kristen Bell that was his day off so he came in for me for my shoot and so it was. Yeah, it, it was uh, uh, so that that that's just gives you kind of a sense of to how involved I was in building our brands and building our properties to really become what they are today. Then after DC, then I end up um, uh, being hired by Hasbro to do the same thing for Transformers. Wow! So, so you came back to Chicago and uh, were there for uh, I'm assuming the Chicago shoot uh, for was it Dark Side? Um, I forget the name of it now. Was it Dark Side of the Moon? No, was I was. Uh, no, I wasn't there for Dark Side. I came in uh, at um, uh, the last night. Oh sure, the Anthony uh, Hopkins one, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I came up with the title too, but the, the, I see. yeah. Wow. <laughs> the film, so, you know, Dark Night last yeah. night. Too, it was like, yeah, they was they had a working title, uh, but the um, when it came to for that, it was. Also, they needed a universe. Uh, I, I created a Bible for them that I had to write and did a ton of research. Because one of the things that was really surprising to me when I first came on at Hasbro was uh, seeing that the Transformers didn't have vulnerabilities, right? And that's why the movies of Michael Bay are so bombastic. It's just about, you know, punching each other and, and using blasters and sure. And there's no no special, there's no signature moves. There's no, uh, you know, I, I, I said, I remember I've said a number of times while I was there, I said, we need to be able to make it so that, 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 that uh, like that Civil War, the movie Civil War, you know, with the uh, um, uh, Captain America Civil War. Yeah. Remember yeah. that airport scene? Of course. Yes, for that. Right. Yeah. That's what I wanted for Transformers to be able to, to I, you know, make them so identifiable for how they move and what their uh, special attributes are. So I had to write all of these things as well as, you know, uh, uh, solidify the canon, define the canon, uh, define what is an all spark, define what is, you know, on and on and on. And so that's why you see the Bumblebee movie that I was in, uh, um, working on. And it, the uh, for the first time you start seeing the more sensible, uh, uh, sensitive side of the characters, more relatable, emotional 
uh, aspects of the characters. Sure. And then uh, the developing Cyberverse uh, for uh, Cartoon Network, uh, no, for uh, Nickelodeon. So it was the first time that I was able to, it was the first time to actually tell origin stories. Because origin stories have never been told for Transformers. Absolutely. So no. And I've always dealt with legacies. So my history is, you know, my, my career has been taking legacy brands, legacy properties, and then making it uh, into global brands that allows people from different ages, age groups, to come in at different points. And so Origins, to me, was very important to start telling. So these kids can really have an affinity and connect with the characters that they are drawn to. Absolutely. And, yeah. yeah. This is why he had to go second. See, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. Uh... David, I'm in, or pardon me, Matt, I am impressed with your your uh, career in the music business. And I, yeah. you know, but now, certainly. Yeah. But so, now we, I get to do it again. I get to do it again with uh, heavy metal. So that's, um, yeah. Yeah. And so, then, and, yeah. No, continue. Excuse me, David. Yeah. So when Matt, uh, you know, offered me to come in on this and I was like, yeah, I guess so. Sure, I'll do it again. <laughs> and and that, that's why I demanded his title be Overlord. <laughs> so, so, so David's official official title is Chief Creative Overlord. I like it. Which, I like it. Which, which only really suits David in, in general. <laughs> well, I want to – one thing before we, we talk about heavy metal. Uh, David, when you were shooting The Dark Knight, you and I were only separated by 25 floors or so because – uh, while Heath was tooling around on his skateboard in the bowels of the Prudential building and the bat cycle was going through the pedway and stuff like that, I was on the uh, 27th floor doing a radio at uh, one, of my, one of my stations. Oh, and I remember our morning man coming in all excited about, I just saw Heath Ledger. He was dressed as a Joker and he's totally just tooling around on his skateboard. It was amazing. So, because they were all just parking, you know. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. He was always on his skateboard. Yeah. When, yeah. And I loved wherever they had the uh, the tumbler, the the Batmobile. Um, it was on Lower Wacker Drive, and I'm going to break into my Chicago accent for a second because so many random people would find it under the drop cloth and stand next to it and be like, "Hey, nice! I'm uh, standing right by the Batmobile over by there. It's pretty cool." You know, <laughs> all these great random pictures. Yeah. And I don't know if that infuriated you guys or not, but as a fan, I was delighted because, like I said, all these jamokes just kind of, "Hey, yes, yeah, me and the Batmobile, you know, just hanging out. It's fine." <laughs> You know, <laughs> well, I have a story with the Batmobile and that the uh, so I had to do a shoot with the Batmobile. And um, so we rented out a studio that's designed specifically for automobiles. And, you know, it has a, uh, uh, a light box, overhanging light box and so forth. And the uh, before the so the and, and the studio was just outside of downtown. Right. So it's kind of this industrial area. And we, uh, uh, so the Batmobile was transferred in this huge trailer on this, you know, flatbed, a okay. flatbed trailer, and it had a, a tarp over it. Yep. And it was really interesting because, you know, remember that that Batmobile looked unlike anything anybody had ever seen before. Absolutely. And so you had a couple of really kind of almost like these, uh, you know, uh, old school gangster type guys with the, you know, uh, banderas on their heads and they're driving in a, in a convertible and th then we're moving the tarp and they're driving by slowly and they see this thing and they go, is that the Batmobile? I mean, they've never seen it, of course, then the, uh, but they still recognize the, the Batmobile. <laughs> was, that, was, that, yeah. was that the black or the camel one? Uh, the, the tumbler, the black tumbler. No, because then wasn't no, the no, original no, right, right. In... just the black one? Because that's the main one, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. Sure. The, Got it. Uh, but speaking of that, when I was working, so Mattel, it was you know, so I'm, I'm attending. Um, so I would lead Mattel's creative um, uh, team on mm -hmm. each of these and, and all the toys and everything that they did for anything exactly. to do with DC, right? Yeah, yeah. So one, uh, so there was this a, um, so after a lot of the early development of the toys, 
then you have this big uh, kind of a show and tell in this atrium that they have with the Warner execs and, and myself. And then you have the president of Mattel there and, and just to review the toy line. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, the Batmobile comes up and then later um, the president was insisting that that doesn't look like the Batmobile to him. So where are the wounds? Where are the scallops? Right. Sure. So he was insistent on getting the um, uh, getting his toy designers to redesign the toy, redesign wow. the Batmobile. Sure. Right. To, to put all that stuff in there, which to me was ridiculous because it's not what's in the movie. So what I did is I I, I I got the guys. I said, all right, let's do this. Let's just have. All right, if he wants the wings and all that stuff that you saw in the previous Batman movie, you know, the Schumacher movie. Sure. Then, all right, well, and Tim Burton, et cetera. So we'll add them as uh, additional pieces that you can add on to it. And the, uh, but let's do it as a second wave. And then the, um, uh, just to satisfy the president of Mattel. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And so that was my resolve. And then the uh, then of course when the Batmobile came out in the uh, at Walmart because I think they had the first uh, they had it a month before everybody else. Okay. And um, before the movie came out, and uh, so not so it must have been on the shelf for like a month and a half. And and I was like, man, it's not selling. I was getting nervous because it wasn't selling. Interesting. Everybody was getting nervous. Wow. And uh, because nobody recognized it as the Batmobile. Even though it's yeah. old, Batmobile, and, and but so, when the movie came out, I was going to say it came out before the movie came out. Obviously, yeah. So when the movie came out, they couldn't keep it in the store. <laughs> couldn't keep it in the store. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's the type of design that you need to see Christian Bale be a badass in for everybody absolutely. to be like, I need that. Oh, absolutely. And um, God, um, I, I, you know, David, you probably were involved. Was it 2010 or 11? at the Hilton at San Diego, where they had all the various Batmobiles on display, including the Tumblr. Oh, right. yeah, yeah. I, I, man, I gotta tell you, seeing it up close and personal, I, it, it's even more impressive. I mean, and it already was. And also the Bat Cycle. And truly, again, that scene where, you know, the Bat Cycle's indoors yeah. and it's in the Pedway, which is this famous kind of walk uh, that you likely know now because you experience it and stuff from one part of the loop to the Prudential building. I walked that every day to work and every, I would park and, you know, walk yeah. down the pedway yeah. and walk to work. And uh, so seeing those scenes and I would, you know, be with my friends like, okay, right there, there's the floor, there's the flower shop, there's the popcorn shop, you know, <laughs> there's so <laughs> many. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, uh, uh, the thing, yeah. So when, when, when I was done with my shoot, right. With the, cause nobody was allowed to go inside the battlefield. Only one driver was allowed wow. to, to do, yeah, to drive it. And, um, so after the shoot, I was like, you know what? I got to get inside. I have to get inside there. <laughs> right. So I had to climb up and I went inside and now, and then I could see why only one driver could do it. Because the thing that, that's interesting is that Chris, I remember when he first had this idea for the Batmobile, he had this really rough sculpture made of the Batmobile and there's no axle between the two front wheels. Oh. If you look at it, there's no, there's no axle, right? They're independent. Interesting. Yeah. And so how do you steer? Yeah. So the, uh, once I was inside, it's uncomfortable as shit. I mean, it's just, it's really it's, all right. I mean, it's, just like, yeah, it's just a bucket seat that's put in this, uh, you know, steel diamond plate. Oh. Uh, interior. And the, uh, and the wheels, you don't have a steering wheel. You have two levers. Like sure. To to guide it. So with wiring, basically, to, to pull the, the wheels in different directions. So that's why there was only one guy who was allowed to drive it, because he's the only one who knew how to drive it. And, uh, wow. Yeah. Was there a modified uniform then, so that he could look like Batman, but obviously can maneuver? Oh, no. The, the windows are so dark. I don't even know, I don't even okay. know how he saw out of it. Interesting. It's really, yeah, <laughs> 
Wow, man! I'm, now I'm gonna have to go back and watch, you know, Dark Knight and, and yeah. Batman Begins and really see. And the way that, yeah, because you know, the, the way these are things, because usually when I work on, on movies and stuff, you have a lot of, you know, you have the design, then it goes to an engineer, and the engineer does really blueprints, detailed blueprints, and specs. This one, they had no idea if it was gonna work or not. <laughs> and so, because it was. Uh, so what uh, Chris did is he hired these guys from the James Bond era movies that did nothing but scratch build. They scratch build it, and they didn't know if it was going to work. So they just they were just building it and uh, trying from this really rough crude model. And uh, but now it's, yeah, it's 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 an amazing amazing Batman film. I think those are incredible stories, and I'm glad you shared those with me, David. And now. Uh, moving on to heavy metal. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, no, no, no. This was. Hey, honestly, man, are you I can I, listen to Batman stories all day. So there's no, there's no complaints here. Well, and also the evolution from, as you say, Batman to Transformers and now heavy metal because exactly. heavy metal has always been an anthology of science fiction. But there, uh, first of all, there is a legacy to heavy metal with a lot of the creators, people yes. like Richard Corbin and Frazetta's uh, wonderful covers and images that have always been involved, um, to name a couple. So. Uh, is there a plan to give us origin stories of some of those properties? Or is it, um, I mean, how, how do you see in terms of, yeah, like creating this Bible for heavy metal as far as a history and lineage? So, so, so John, for Dave and I, I think, yeah. I think the first thing we did when, after we kind of uh, got, our, got our bearings and, and started at the company was define that heavy metal Bible. And, and we we started with Tarna, right? Tarna to us sure. is is the linchpin, as David would say. And um, who created and, Tarna, by the way? And you obviously you're talking about the silver for people who may not remember the name, the silver haired uh, beauty. That's uh, you know the last arc in the heavy metal uh, movie, the anthology movie, and everything. But yeah, I don't even remember who created Tarna. Yeah, I think the actual origins are a little uh, mysterious. Oh, okay. Uh, it, it was, <laughs> by committee, it was, uh, the you know, we're talking about a character created pre-computers and not necessarily with archive warehouses like Warner. So some of the original stories are uh, are lost to mystery, but okay. um, but we have her today, and uh, and we're we we define that Bible and what she is and who she is and how she operates within the universe and universes, right? And um, that's great. And and I'll let David dive into that a little bit more. But but for us, it was like kind of defining a, a, a handful of the classics while using the attitude of heavy metal to introduce new characters sure. and new new uh, mythologies. But uh, but always always with a really uh, elaborate and intricate origin story. Because as David said, and and I, I share the um, I share the sentiment is origin stories aren't great just because of the uh, entry points in, but because of the, uh, to, to me, when, when you're telling stories, you want people to care, but you need to give them reasons to care, right? right? If you don't give people reasons to care, then why do you expect them to read your story? So having all of that stuff created and understood and working lock and step with, with the main arc of the universe was I think the first thing we cared to, to really make sure we we had ironed, uh, right, right, David? Yeah, you know, we both recognize that Tarno is the mo is the most recognized uh, iconic character of the heavy metal universe. Um, people always come back to her as representing heavy metal. So understanding that, it was important for us to all right. So how do we really uh, cement her place in the heavy metal universe? and really be the linchpin that takes us across all the different types of stories that heavy metal is known for. Because there's many different types of universes within uh, the heavy metal stories and, and different timelines, right? Yes, so, so we needed to make her not quite godlike, but somewhat uh, uh, eternal. And so we crafted a Bible that really, I think, speaks to that and grounds it in a way that makes sense to uh, not only us, but hopefully the audience. And the uh, and we're really going to be elevating her 
and, and uh, leaning into her as being our our, our mascot. And uh, and then along with that, where we are again had mined some of the other um, properties that uh, that were identifiable and had a little bit of fan base. And so we've been building those out as well. And they'll be coming out in both having their own title. Tarna will have her own comic book title. Um, the Nelson, the zombie that people always remember from the uh, uh, from the the World War II in the feature film. So that's being we've developed that and created a Bible, and it's a whole new take on how how, how people think of zombies, mm -hmm. and um, and that's why uh, it's already it's already announced. So we could we could actually talk about it. It's the, all it's all yeah. So 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 we we have George Romero uh, Jr. Right, right. Uh, taking a stab at writing the script for the first Nelson story, which is really exciting. Uh, yeah. Bringing sort of mm -hmm. that sort of zombie uh, uh, heritage, and uh, and we we dubbed the series uh, "Cold Dead War," and uh, the Cold Dead are our uh, our uh, zombies. Yeah, how, it's how we describe the zombies. Uh, the about uh, along with that, what we've done is by having George Romero Jr. I mean, the son of the father of modern zombies. Sure. I mean, the, the author of our uh, initial uh, comic book series just helps to solidify us as, uh, as owning horror as one of our genres as well. Because one of the things that uh, we, we talk about um, with others is that heavy metal is known as, as far as its legacy as really being the premier publisher of science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Absolutely. Right? Now you, you can take out, you can you can mention all these other publishers, DC and Marvel, and right away your brain goes to superheroes. Sure. You know, they've published you know, science fiction and fantasy and horror in the past, right? But, and, and, same, and then you think about any other publisher that's out there, uh, you know, whether it's IDW or, or Dark Horse or whatnot, uh, they're all great publishers. But they don't have a brand that really you mention their name and you think of a particular genre. So, um, and, and we recognize that, and so, and we also recognize the fact that it's uh, uh, it is one of the most influential uh, publishing for people who are leaders in entertainment. Whether it's Ridley Scott was influenced, uh, Zack Snyder, James Cameron. Yeah, it just goes down, right? Sure. Yeah, and, and then contributors like Stephen King has been a contributor. You have uh, Jack you know, Kirby. Uh, yeah, yeah, Jack Absolutely. Kirby, and then you got uh, you know John Carpenter, and mm -hmm. go on and on and on, right? Howard so, Chaykin, Richard Corbin. Yeah, you know, yeah. to name a couple of the other. Yeah, and these are all right. And Chaykin uh, contributed with Star Wars, right? Uh, early Star yeah. Wars. And then, yeah. So again. Understanding that, then now it's about, all right, we need to be in the forefront again. We need to lead the charge and really be the brand that uh, once again represents that we are uh, uh, cutting edge and we're challenging ourselves and challenging creators and to, to really create compelling stories. And the beauty about fantasy or, you know, all those genres is that you can, you can, um, tackle difficult issues or issues that people are uh, uneasy about having a discussion or, or and um, you take, you know, a horror movie like uh, Get Out, right? So it's dealing with the social issue that and is still prevalent today and still exists today, but it's not something that people want to go and spend their money and sit for two hours and watch. So. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not Spike Lee where you're going to be preached to. It's you know you want to be entertained, but sure. then you want to have something that actually kind of has a message as well that is, uh, doesn't beat you over the head. And Rod so, Serling did that with the Twilight Zone. I, there's that. It's so funny. I literally was talking about that wonderful interview he did with Mike Wallace in the late '50s, and Mike yeah. Wallace is like, "What are you doing playing with fantasy and science fiction?" And Serling was very much an advocate, saying, "No, you don't understand. I can tackle social issues." In yeah. these realms, so exactly, no, I get it. Gene Roddenberry too, absolutely. Yeah, which is, which is uh, my favorite, right? I, I always, I always talk about the uh, the original Star Trek episode with the uh, the tribe that had the left, white, and black 
right and then the left black and uh, white uh, right side faces and how uh, he used that as a uh, as a vehicle to talk about racism in America. Absolutely. Right? Let and, that be your last battlefield. That was the title of that episode. Exactly. Right. I'm a big trick yeah. nerd. Don't worry, man. I'm right there with you. Uh, man. Well, we, we could, we, <laughs> trust me, we could spend hours talking about Trek. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, to, 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 to both your points, that, that is a, a huge piece uh, with heavy metal is being able to be that lens, right? Because yes. not only are we uh, that name synonymous with uh, science fiction, fantasy, and horror, but we're also a brand that can be that bold and that edgy and that, uh, um, and that loud you know, with those topics and with those um, uh, 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 moralities to sure. talk about. Uh, whereas some other brands might either due to corporate money or brand ethos need to stay a little bit more centered. We, we have the, the latitude to be on the fringe because of what heavy metal defines. And uh, that I think is what David and I are, are the most excited about is that we can actually tell the stories that we've always wanted to tell, but maybe uh, circumstances uh, wouldn't always allow you to tell it exactly that way. But heavy metal gives you that platform to say, no, double down on the thing that you really want to focus on. Don't, don't water it out. So are you, uh, again, one of the hallmarks of heavy metal has always been being an anthology, you know, exposing a lot of us here in North America to the world of comics in a lot of great ways. And I know uh, we'll talk about the virus uh, books and stuff, and clearly uh, they have some international backgrounds to them as well. So is there, I, I, how, are, how are you curating the, the sure. choices beyond, beyond the established characters that we associate with heavy metal? Is there still room for the one shots and the and the various stories that yeah, have I'll, always been part of that. I'll start it and then I'll, I'll hand off to David. I think I think for us it's it's a a more a more broad spanning statement is that we really want to always make sure we pay homage and, and give service to the fans that have been with us since seventy seven, right? Like we can't not uh, make sure that we service those people, right? Uh, with the anthology stories, a, an awesome four to ten pager in the magazine, but. We also want to move forward in time. Sure. And uh, with that, it's also uh, doing more serializations in the magazine with really awesome creators that, uh, that, are, um, uh, that are both local and international. We just signed some original stories that will be serialized from some top creators in Italy, as well as people Great. in America, such as uh, Ron Mars and Bart Sears. And, and other really, really strong creators and, and making sure that we have a basis of new story mixed with the servicing of anthologies is kind of the uh, kind of top level mandate that we always keep with ourselves. But may maybe David, you have some more uh, poignant. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, as Matt said, as Matt said, I mean, heavy metal has uh, always been an anthology. Right. So, and within that anthology, you have uh, short stories that are self-contained, and then you have uh, stories that are serialized over months. Sure. And we are going to, con and and so it was. We both agree that we need to maintain that and keep that going, and because there's a certain expectation that uh, the existed that the current fans um, expect from it, and so we'll continue to to publish. Uh, the, the names of like Richard Corbin and, and other uh, uh, artists who have contributed over the years and maintain the course with them and uh, because they continue to create great quality work that yeah. uh, and, and the art is always amazing. But at the same time, we want to start uh, building out our universe and things that have a little bit more ownership within our universe. And uh, but it has to still fit with the same sort of attitude and, and the variety. Uh, you know, one way that I, I, I describe it is we want to be the bit, you know, we're Ben and Jared's. We're not, uh, <laughs> you know, we're not uh, haagen with just, you know, your French vanilla and that sort of thing. You know, we want to, we want to be- Weird, weird, uh, yeah. weird con confection concoctions that all work. That's great. Yeah, so, and because the, the thing with anthology, which is always uh, a challenge is that you know, nobody's going to like every story. Sure. So 
but you want to be able to have something in there that actually, you know, that, that was like, wow, that was, that was, a, that was a good read. And so we're continuing with that with heavy metal and we continue to, um, you know, because it's, it, because it's been around for so long, we're always being solicited or, or solicited for, uh, or su submissions are always being made. Right. So we're always vetting submissions from all over the world and from many different publishers. So the big challenge is, you know, trying to edit it down as to what, what we want to publish in that. Because one of the things that, that may, that Matt really want, uh, wanted everybody to get rally around was for us to become a monthly again, because in the past, before the new team, the, it has always been erratic. And you didn't know how many times it was, when it was going to come out, and sure. sometimes it's five issues a year, sometimes it's eight. Who knows? It was just always uh, uh, just up in the air. And, and what happens is it becomes difficult to really maintain your your audience. Well, if, of course, yeah. If yeah. you can't be consistent, so after issue three hundred, unfortunately, we came in at a time where issue three hundred is just down the horizon, and so. Uh, from issue 300 on, we're going monthly. Okay. And then in addition to having the monthly, we're also doing um, titled comic books. So that way we can have, you know, we would like to see Heavy Metal have a constant presence in the comic book stores. Because, you know, you got the, the new this month or new this week wall. And yeah. So, yeah, so we want to keep a constant presence and really Fine. get people to understand, hey, not, you know, heavy metal is still alive. Not only are we alive, but we're coming back strong and we have all this great stuff that we want to share with you. And, and, and then in addition to that, with all of the serials that will be starting from issue 300, those serials will be packaged mm -hmm. as single issues as well with never before mm -hmm. seen inks or pencils, some uh, key art, lore, other things around the story as single issues that will be sold at two ninety nine instead of three ninety nine okay. uh, throughout the life of those stories in comic book shops as well. So uh, to, to David's original point with um, with uh, creating that backstory is uh, points of entry. Uh, both even not in just the story, but also in the physical uh, 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 ability to get the the story itself maybe a magazine that has a, um, a character on it doesn't grab your attention, but this uh, spaceship cover does. And that was one of the stories within the magazine. So you pick up that single issue, you read and like, wow, this is really cool. And then next month you get the magazine and it just allows for a younger generation that uh, is used to looking at that uh, wall with single issues to have a shorter, easier in entry point to the HMU. Makes a lot of sense, guys. Absolutely. And I think that's great. And it still re retains the flavor of heavy metal, but it's, again, in a easier to digest. And especially, as you say, getting this new audience aware. I, you know, you'll forgive me because, again, being an older reader, um, I don't know if you guys are aware, but a couple of years ago, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar had uh, written a graphic novel about uh, Mycroft Holmes. And I asked him, I said, you know, are you still reading comics? He's like, I read heavy metal all the time. And in uh, fact, used to bring it to uh, his workouts for the Lakers. And, you know, like some of the guys would give him a look at everything. And it's like, hey, it's Kareem. You, you argue with him and what he's reading and what he isn't reading. But <laughs> I love the fact that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is a massive heavy metal fan. And I'll even throw it out there, guys. You might want to talk to him. He might yeah. have a story for you. So I, I, think, really, you know. I actually have a really good uh, relationship with the head of uh, sponsorships at the Lakers. I'm going to oh, hit her great. up. I'm going to hit her up right oh, now. Oh, I hope that happens, man. I really do. <laughs> I, I, because seriously, that uh, that just delighted me. That would be that, epic. That Kareem is one of us. And I think that's fantastic. So, you that's know. That's really so. cool. And, and, and about being one of us, uh, uh, another thing I want to just touch on uh, on this topic is uh, as we are paying uh, homage to the Richard Corbins and the Frazettas and, and all of these people, we all, I, I also, and David obviously as well, are, are very acutely aware that some of these big names, uh, be it Mobius or, uh, or even Corbin and all these people, uh, Stephen King also, 
were published in the magazine before they were who we know them to be today. Yes. So it is really important for David and I to kind of find uh, what we call new Hollywood or, or that young talent. Of and course. some of those people that we've kind of identified as is everyone from Dylan Sprouse, who had his uh, TV show on uh, Disney Channel, is uh, now writing a really adult werewolf story called Sun Eater that we're publishing with our partners, Diga Studios. Um, we brought in Brendan Columbus, the son of Chris Columbus, who okay. Goonies, Home Alone, Harry sure. Potter. And Absolutely. Brendan is writing two different stories for us. Um, one for the magazine and one uh, for another project that uh, has yet to be announced. Great. But, uh, and, then, uh, and then we have uh, Dan Fogler, who uh, is in Fantastic Lovely. Beasts and Walking Dead. Yes. And uh, we've uh, gone behind his three new projects, Brooklyn Gladiator, Fish Kill, and Moon Lake. And those will be coming out this summer as well. So, oh, that's so great. I'm a big – Dan is – Man, I love uh, and now Balls of Fury, of course, is great. Comedy. Balls of Fury, it's the <laughs> the fan favorite, right? You know that that, that that's that, that that's the thing that's so great is like Balls of Fury is uh, obviously it's not winning any Oscars, but it is such a it is such a it's a cult film. film. Yeah, it's a cult film. Yeah. yeah, but then but then you see him as uh, Kowalski in Fantastic Beasts, and yeah, and you absolutely. start to see that he's actually uh, moving to a more serious acting style. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, just you know, talking to him is infectious. Uh, if you've ever talked that. to him, I've met, yeah, I've, I've met him at Comic Con, and I certainly followed his uh, previous comic book uh, projects. So uh, no, I think that's a great get for you guys. And absolutely, having the Fantastic Beast connection is certainly going to bring in the young readers. And then we all know from fanboys and Balls of Fury and stuff. It's like, yeah, Dan's always been with us. So that's another always again, been with us. Yeah, you know, and, and, and I mean, and, and there's a lot of a lot of these guys, uh, as you said with Kareem. Like we have um, uh, Kune Kunel Kumel, who's oh. in Eternals. Um, we have photos of him just hanging around the heavy metal booth from 2018 at Comic Con. He's a that's huge great. heavy metal fan. And uh, th there's a lot of them, right? And I think uh, more so than bringing the young readers is we, we Dave and I just are really uh, excited to create a playground for creators that um, want to create within this sort of loud and bold storytelling narrative. <laughs> That's great. What can you tell us about uh, issue 300 and when is it coming out? So it's coming out now, August 17th. It was supposed okay. to come out the week of Comic-Con. Obviously, the world yeah. has made a change of plans for everyone. Sure, sure. And, and uh, Diamond had to shut down for a month. And basically, everything from that catalog got moved just a month later. So previews came out last week. Um, right. Heavy Metal has has a two page spread and a oh, full page Dan Fogler interview. So if you're if you're a comic book shop and you're looking uh, through previews, listening to this, find the the Heavy Metal pages. But it's um, it, it, it the three hundred is going to have a, a new original Mobius stories that have only wow. ever been um, published in France. Wow, uh, and, and we, we were able to do a, a really awesome licensing deal with Humanoids to be able to get that get that in three hundred, and, and they've been an amazing partner for it. Um, and then, and then there's going to be a lot of new, right? They'll, they'll be they'll be establishing storylines for Nelson, for Tarna. Um, David has an amazing new story that will be in 300. Uh, I, I have a story that pays homage to my love for Gene Rottenberry, um, uh, cool. Dylan Sprouse, Brendan Columbus. Uh, there, there, there's a ton of uh, uh, kind of new and and old in 300. We obviously still have Richard Corbin in 300. Terrific. And uh, yeah, I mean, David, is there any any other? Uh, am I have I hit it all, or is there anything well, I'm missing? Yeah, so we, yeah, of course. Uh, so, so since it is 300, we need to make sure that we commemorate you know those who, from the past. Some of the, and and so that's why it was important that uh, we track down an unpublished Mobius piece, right? And that's great. Um, and then of course uh, Corbin is continuing with the. Uh, the story that he's been doing for heavy metal, even prior Murphy to World. here. Uh, World, okay. we, yeah, and then uh, we have, um, I, I felt it was important, I'm a big Von Bodhi fan. And so sure. um, we reached out to his son, Mark, and he had, we asked, Can is there anything that has never been published? So 
he found, you know, went to the archive, found some stuff. Plus, he's contributing stuff as well. He's great. He's doing, and he's um, he's doing a sun pot for us that he's uh, inking and coloring. And then he's doing a um, uh, uh, kind of an update on Cobalt 60, but he's calling it Cobalt 19. Okay. Um, <laughs> But the uh, yeah, we were really, really looking forward to going to San Diego Comic Con because we're going to make a big splash, you know, sure. with all of the the new initiatives and the new direction we're going, and then the uh, so. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll we'll figure out something in the next San Diego Comic Con. I hear you, man. Absolutely, and uh, yeah, it's it's a shame, but you know, eventually things will get yeah. back to some semblance of normal. Uh, you know, we all wonder what that will be. But the great thing is, yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad to hear that it's going to be this combination of honoring the legacy of, of heavy metal, but also moving forward. And, and it sounds, again, like the directions you're going in are uh, uh, tying to the legacy. So I think that's, exactly. that's terrific. That's great. Um, yeah, we, 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 we really wanted to make sure that as we expand it, we don't lose sight of the stronghold. Right, and to us, the stronghold's a magazine, right? Just in general, sure. uh, no matter what other initiatives we might do, be it a uh, new series, uh, other audiovisual uh, things that we could work on, TV, film, podcast, etc. That a magazine is what kind of tied it all together. I, I always like to look at it as a uh, as an airport, as a terminal, right? The magazine allows different planes to take off. If you don't keep your terminal really clean and really updated, then you're not going to have planes coming in to take people to their destinations. <laughs> yeah, and then to add, to add on to that is that the um, with um, yeah, so heavy metal will always, like I said, since we we want to really kind of set the always be the, the the magazine that sets the bar, the publishing. So we're very respectful, and it's still you know the vetting is much more um, uh, tighter and demanding and but and that's kind of a nice kind of a transition or segue into virus because we get so many submissions right and we can't publish it all even and some even, of them are really great yeah and, and even going into a monthly even going into a, a becoming a monthly there's still not enough um Base. You know, yeah we, we, yeah we can't, we can't print them all right sure sure that, you know, and let me ask you, and here, by the way, we will show the uh, the virus logo. There we go. Uh, so and we'll talk about some of the books that you've already announced. But um, I, I do have a lot of aspiring writers uh, that are trying to break in, and I'm sure they are interested in knowing what your general submission policy might be, if you guys don't mind explaining. Yeah, I mean, you, you can you can submit to virus at heavymetal.com. Super simple. Um, we like to have the books fully completed. And um, and then we kind of review them. Obviously, they need to be in that sci-fi, fantasy, horror, cosmic horror sort of umbrella. And uh, yeah, it's really that easy. Submit the final books. We'll, we'll see uh, if it makes sense. And if it does, the deals are super straightforward. It's 15% of the cover price from the first book sold. So whatever we decide together is the right price to sell it at, let's say it's $10, they make $1.50 per book from the jump. There's no recruitment. There's no uh, outlanding of any cash. It's all printed materials. We've uh, partnered in with our printer, uh, and we have a small batch printing uh, fulfillment mechanism that we've created that allows us to only print the books needed. So we don't need to print 10, 20, 30,000 copies to get the price you need to make the, the economy of comics make sense. Um, so we're able to print them as it, as it, uh, as the orders come in, which then allows us to pay our creators sooner. Okay. Yeah, I mean, no, you know, no just to Image. Image is a great publishing company, but uh, you know they, yeah, they, it's creator owned. So that's one of the things. So Image is a creator owned, driven company, but you have to shell out, you have to lay out, you know, a good chunk of money in order for them to do the solicitation and manage it all, and et cetera. And then, then there's a, a printing. And, and uh, so you don't, so the creator doesn't really see anything until the company itself, the publishing uh, image, uh, recoups their money, right? Right. Mm -hmm. for us, uh, us, from day one, you know, from your the first copy sold, 
you are making money from it. And now, and so it's, and same with, well, sorry, let me, uh, no, no it's, it's, it's COVID. It's COVID. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's New York City. You can't help it. Um, so when it comes to the, uh, um, with us, it, it's a very attractive, I think it's very beneficial for the creators. And, um, and it's really set up for that. And it also allows us to uh, share more voices and that are out there because heavy metal, you mentioned it earlier, John, is that we, you know, it has, has always been kind of this platform to showcase um, creators from all over the world. Absolutely. And totally. so here's a true, you know, here's a, again, another platform that allows people from all over the world to be part of this pub, this imprint of ours. And one of the, so some of the first books that we came out with are these amazing uh, creators from South America and really great stories. And every, you know, every culture has their own sensibility. And, and I'm, I'm fascinated by that. And they're always kind of interesting. I mean, if you watch an Australian horror film, it's much different than a Japanese horror film. Absolutely. Right? So totally. these are the types. So this becomes just an amazing place where we can give these uh, creators an opportunity to reach a larger audience that they wouldn't have otherwise. And, and, and cross pollinate with each other, right? Which, which is which is what I think is the most exciting part. A, a, a totally random yet I think acceptable comparison is uh, I, I'm obsessed with uh, David Chang's Ugly Delicious uh, a TV show on Netflix. And uh, they just did an episode called Meat. And what's really interesting is that there's this Lebanese, um, shop in in Chicago in, in the Illinois area might not be directly in Chicago that does traditional Lebanese bread but rolls them up as sandwiches and puts hot Cheetos on them and all these other American things which at first you're like oh my god he's destroying the uh the Lebanese culture, culture sure. right but what you find out in the show is that that the the restaurants in Lebanon are actually following them Right. Wow. So, so, so there is this amazing ability for cultures to congeal, Agreed. be it in comics or in food, and then create something new out of it. And, and I think to David's point, virus allows us to kind of show the sensibilities of creators throughout the whole world and see where other creators might find that inspiration to create something really unique. Yeah. So to say on that, you know, say on the, the analogy of food. You know, I always say Food Network changed the way the world eats, right? Totally. Before food Network, you know, we, we, we just kind of ate what was familiar to us. Sure. But, you know, Bizarre Food and all of those types of shows that came out that we were watching and so forth. Suddenly it's opened up where everybody is willing to try different things. And Chicago is a great food mecca. You go to, oh, yeah. The, yeah, go to those food courts and it's just like from everywhere. But... Now, instead of kind of shutting away from it, we embrace it. Everybody, so, and it's, it's and, the, and so much of it is about exposing people. Mm -hmm. I, and, and experimenting, right? I mean, uh, we, we, we have a, uh, every, every, it feels like every week at this point, David, you, uh, he, he comes on one of our, our video conference calls with a cronut. Every week it feels <laughs> like. <laughs> and, and it's the greatest thing ever, but right. Yeah. But but imagine ten or imagine twenty years ago, someone saying, "Hey, let's make a croissant and a donut together." Most people would be like, "You're out of your mind. Yeah, no way. How does yeah, it exactly. exactly?" But but to David's point, the <laughs> the influx of food shows, be it Food Network, YouTube, etc., has created this almost love for the the experiment with food, right? For, for every one cronut, there's a thousand products that were tried. Most people were like, mm, probably not the move, but it was tried, right? Sure, and then yeah. every so often you strike gold and you get a cronut. And, and, and I think I think uh, we, we, we see story the same exact way. Yeah. And it, we're also huge foodies, yeah, it, obviously. It, it, people have become more adventurous. People have become yes. more adventurous, right? And, but, you, but, it, but the adventure, this comes from 
uh, following these different food show hosts, whether it's David Chang or Andrew Zimmer or whatever, and then showing, hey, it's okay, and then um, uh, you got to try. Uh, Gary. It's open everybody's mind. And so it's the same thing with virus. Uh, heavy metal did that, right? Heavy metal did that. Yeah. It exposed us to Mobius. Who, you know, what absolutely, man. The yeah, entire and, world. And, and not, not only yeah. did it expose us to Mobius, it exposed it, it exposed George Lucas to Mobius, Agreed. right? Uh, and that, that's a thing that I always like to talk about is that Lucas found Mobius through heavy metal, and then Mobius did a ton of concept art for The Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. Right, and then that sort of <laughs> cultural phenomenon that heavy metal is at the epicenter of is what we want to bring back in more ways. Right, we don't want to take that away from the magazine, but we want to amplify it. Sure. And virus is a way to amplify that. That's excellent. You guys have uh, provided a couple uh, uh, versions of, of new virus books, and uh, one is an anthology. And I'm going to bring up the uh, the cover. Yeah, Garbage Factory. So. Because and I and I ask because as you say you want complete books so um, uh, explain to me like is Garbage Factory something you bought as a whole or did you guys put this together? Yeah no so so we, we bought that as a whole. Danny Kim is is an amazing creator out of South Korea um, that I've been following and talking to for years and uh, someone whose sensibilities I just think are so unique to the Korean culture of art that when we had uh, found Virus and Dave and I were talking about what sort of stories and things we should put in it, I was like, I have a creator in Seoul who I think really fits that idea of showing the world different styles. So I, I literally just hit up Danny and was like, hey, do you have anything? He's like, I'm finishing an anthology series that I think would be perfect. And he sent us the final draft and we thought it was amazing and there it is. Lots of different art styles inside of Garbage Factory. And yeah, it's very cool. And, and I'm glad to hear that you are tapping the Korean market because I think sometimes uh, in North America, we may forget of the, the, the great books that uh, Korea has been putting out. I mean, finally, uh, with, uh, you know, Parasite, uh, the, you know, the, the North Americans, we're all getting hip to how great South Korean filmmaking right. has been for decades and stuff. So it's nice to see the comics follow as well. I, I was in New York City for a day of meetings with David, and we actually decided to play hooky on half of those days' meetings to see Parasite in theater. That's so great. It, it was fantastic. That's excellent. And I, I, I'm, uh, I'm in the Screen Actors Guild because it merged with the TV and radio union, and so uh, I, I get my SAG uh, screeners, and that's how I saw Parasite. I was blown oh, amazing. Out, you know? And and you know it, that was yeah that was terrific. So another uh, another book is uh, the red. So tell us about the red. Yeah, so so the red is actually the uh, the first comic book that I ever wrote. Uh, so I wrote that with my my team over at Hero, and we we conceptualized it five years ago. Okay, and and started putting it together, but never really finished it. We had other books and other projects that made more sense at the time to really focus on. And uh, as as Virus uh, was being built, it seemed like the perfect time to bring that and tie the tie the knots on across the T's, dot the I's and, and bring it to life. But uh, it's, a, it's a dystopian future where emotion is, uh, is banned. And uh, from my point of view, I think the, I think it's, it's a, it's a really interesting uh, look into our society today, because even though emotion's not banned, I, I think the degree of political correctness that our society is operating under almost pulls emotion out of society, because you have to be so careful about what you say, how you say it, and who you say it to, that you lose the ability to just have a stream of consciousness that tells you how you think. So I think I, uh, I think the story is very timely for how uh, our society is moving. Excellent. Now, and have, have these come out yet or are they still coming out? Or are they are still yet to be? Uh, so so Garbage Factory is out on our store. Um, uh, the Red Issue 1 is out. Uh, Red will be a uh, quarterly. So it's about a 50-page book every quarter. Uh, okay. And all, all of the virus books will start to be in comic book shops around quarter four. We, uh, we didn't okay. want to... Uh, inundate shops with a bunch of new titles as sure. they were 
figuring out this new norm. Absolutely. And yes. uh, we, we've been working with uh, with most of these shops kind of uh, uh, lock and step to find the right time to introduce these books. And we, we've all kind of settled on a September, October in November release where one to two virus books will be debuted every week starting in September. Very cool. Yeah, and, and, uh, and I, I, yeah please do. Uh, I'm sorry. I was just going to add to that saying that the, uh, the, the, the nice thing about our platform is it allows us to better uh, determine, make a better determination as to what we think the was, is going to serve the, the retail stores, right? Because we don't want to just send out everything. Sure. We want to make sure, we want to make sure that we, um, we are respectful to their business and give them the the best titles that have uh, that we've seen success behind. Well, unlike 2000 AD, I I'm, and this is just me guessing. You'll can correct me if I'm wrong. You guys have always had a strong subscription base. So I mean, yes. even even with the problems that you know shops obviously had with Diamond having to shut down, and you know the comic the comic uh, direct market having to be put on pause. Um, you know, again, maybe with the subscription base and stuff, I don't know how you guys were able to operate during so, this period. Yeah, so so um, fortunately uh, for heavy metal, and, and it has been a, a crazy time for a lot of publishers, but our fulfillment uh, mechanism for our online shop, so so everything bought on heavymetal.com uh, is all printed, right? We don't sell anything digital, and okay. we've, we've had a... Uh, we have the, and I, I don't just say this and everybody says it, but we have literally the best fans in the world because not only have we stayed open during this time, but we've actually grown exponentially um, by about 45% wow. uh, month over month since, since the beginning of this pandemic. And, wow. and we, we think the, the fans, the readers, everybody has been uh, coming to Heavy Metal uh, basically asking us, how can we fill our time with more story? And that was really the, the crux of creating Virus, was, okay. was we saw this influx of fandom, people coming and basically asking, what else do you have? And we were able to create this small batch printing uh, system with Virus so that we were able to quickly activate all of these books on our online shop without really any big risk on the inventory but be able to really quickly create something that fans could explore and find tastes that interested them during this time where they have so much more time to read and explore new genre. Yeah. Yeah. And then that, that's a very important in um, people understanding how virus came about. And it was the fact that, uh, you know, we realized we had this infrastructure in place because of the subscription, right? So we knew that about, so we already had a fulfillment in place. And then our, on our publishing side, uh, Matt was looking to move, move our uh, offset printing into digital printing. And I was skeptical of it until he reminded me that the books that he had been publishing under Hero were actually digital printed. And, I, and so I went back to the stack that, it, that he had given me and I was blown away. I was like, really, this is really beautiful printed. I wouldn't have, you know, and, uh, and I've known printing over the years and so, sure. Uh, then it was a, a, you know, just a flashbulb, and within six weeks, we were able to get that up and running and have the content lined up. So it, it allowed us to be really uh, uh, to to find a way that we can continue to serve our customers and our and our fans, and and uh, and because we don't know, you know, how many casualties are going to come out of this, you know, with the, uh, and we want to make sure. That if you if you enjoy sequential storytelling, and then we want to be able to um, give you a place where you can still acquire these printed books. You know, if your comic shop is no longer there or it's too far away, whatever. So now uh, and again, and then at the same time, bring in all these other uh, um, uh, international uh, voices. And and one of the things we're looking at is. Since they are coming from, we, we do have a lot of um, uh, avenues for these uh, international creators. We're looking at having a drop down in our site that allows you to buy it either in their native language or in English. Yep. Very cool. That's excellent. No, it makes a lot of sense. I see two other books that I got access to, and uh, that's, uh, is that uh, Hymn of the? Hymn of the Tieta. 
Which is a, thank you. Yep. Which was created by this amazing uh, woman out of uh, out of Okinawa, Japan, Julia Melker. And uh, Julia came to me and uh, had this world and story that was a mix of fantasy and history, and which I always I'm always a sucker for. I'm always a sucker for anything that turns real history into a action adventure, fantastical journey. I'm with you. Um, yeah. It's always fun. So, so she, so I worked with her in adapting that story into something that I believe would work for the American market, and uh, that that is also something that will be coming out quarterly. And uh, the, the, that story is just uh, it's it's really about the battles of Ryukyu and uh, the Korean and Japanese sort of uh, conflicts over over the years in the 15th, 16th, 1700s. Sure. Through flashbacks of using a time traveling stone uh, oh, wow. it's a, yeah so it, it, it's really a re really fun story that that i think also lends some some interesting history to to the island uh, of okinawa which is really cool that's awesome and then finally uh uh Numb nomobots nomobots is a great one uh, to, to david uh point earlier that that is a um a, a uh, south american creator who had a, uh, I believe it's six uh, issues completed. And our managing editor, Ricardo, uh, found it uh, through kind of a bunch of submissions and we uh, we want to get behind him. And uh, the Nomobots uh, issue two comes out next week. Um, uh, they'll start in September in stores and we have, uh, we have the first graphic novel already uh, done that we're uh, gonna be releasing over the next uh, few weeks and months. And uh, we're excited for the fans to see it. That's cool, man. So these are the first four. Is this the first wave of? So, so we actually have now. I believe it's twelve that are released. Wow. Yeah. So so we have uh, we have a self imposed mandate to release two books every Wednesday. Okay. And we we've been able to stay on track with that since I think the first Wednesday was March 29th or April third. Whatever, whatever that first uh, that first Wednesday was in April, which right. I think was still March. Um, we March these four, and then two every week since. Yep, okay, exactly. Yeah, so uh, sometimes they're single issues, sometimes they're one shots, sometimes they're quarterlies, sometimes they're graphic novels. Uh, we put out a graphic novel called The Trap Door, which is a take on the Phantom of the Opera, uh, and we have another series came out that's called Mortis, which comes out monthly like Nomobots. Uh, and then uh, in June, we will be putting on sale uh, Bob Fingerman's Do Dottie Inferno, which would be really, really cool. Um, That's great. I'm a big fan yeah, of Yeah, and, then, and then we have uh, Marvel and DC's uh, Justin Gray. Uh, oh, sure. put out a ton of things over the years. And we're oh, yeah, one of the Jonah series. Hex writers. So absolutely. Yes. With yeah, Jimmy yeah. Palmiotti. Exactly. Yeah, and then with Fingerman's uh, book, you know, Fingerman reached out to a few of his friends and they each have contributed contributed a brand new pinup inside the book. So wow! From Wilson, Kevich, Magnola. Wow! Chaykin, Chaykin, terrific. So, I love all three of those guys. So that's fantastic. You know, yeah, yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. That hey, that's wonderful. So where do you want to direct people to? Uh, you know, uh, be aware of what's coming up in Heavy Metal Three Hundred. And beyond, and then also, and I imagine too that you know you've got previews of the you know what you're going to do with Tarna and uh, and and the other books and stuff. But uh, then also the virus line. So yes, people go totally. If you go if you go to heavymetal.com, uh, it, it has everything there right on the top. If you top left of the of the splash page is, is called the Forge, which is uh, the Forge is our uh, new site um, within within heavy metal. Uh, obviously, you, you get the naming. Then we have the shop. Uh, where you can buy everything and then we have a place for you to subscribe to the newsletter if you subscribe to the newsletter it comes out twice a week on mondays and thursdays as well as a wednesday newsletter for all new virus titles uh and that that is the best way to mindlessly stay up to date we will we will tell you everything just just subscribe to the newsletter and then monday's heavy metal wednesday is virus thursday's heavy metal and uh, and yeah, and that, that, that's kind of the best place to see all the things that are happening in, in real time. That's cool, man. It sounds great. Uh, I think this is a great new direction for heavy metal. And I think, again, you're retaining the best things about its legacy. 
and pushing, as you said, the brand forward and coming up with a cohesive Bible and a, and a place to exploit some of these great ideas beyond what we saw in the movies or, or you know, in the past and everything. And also, again, adding new, new stuff. And Virus sounds like an interesting initiative as well, uh, where you're, you're really tapping to, again, globally, as you always have with heavy metal, uh, to find the, the best people and uh, give us new books and, and interesting ideas. You know, I think as readers get older, you know, I mean, hey, I'm, I'm in my 50s. I still like a good superhero story. But I mean, it really, you know, I think around high school or college, it was like, all right, what else is out there? And I, that's really kind of when I embraced heavy metal in the, in the 80s and stuff and really appreciated what was, uh, was coming out then. And you know the movie didn't hurt. That was that was a lot of fun. And uh, so no, I think I think this is a, a bold and, and consistent direction, as well as it being a new direction for heavy metal. So, congratulations on the concept and uh, much success. And uh, yeah, it'd, it'd be a pleasure to talk to you guys again and uh, pre and have maybe a couple of the creators on and then talk about some of these uh, interesting new ideas from. Heavy we metal. would love to totally. Yeah. So thank you for having us. Thanks again for watching another Word Balloon video. We've got plenty more at our channel, Word Balloon. If you enjoyed it, please like it and consider subscribing to the channel. And of course, support me on Patreon, patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Thanks a lot for watching.